So our talk today is about how data mesh and inner source can work beautifully together in large scale organizations. Um, or, if, or if you prefer, how inner source and data mesh um, became best friends uh, at Caring. Before we, we, we start, maybe a, a quick word of intro uh, from Carol and I. So hello everyone, my name is Carol and I'm Global Head of Tech Data at Caring. Okay, hi, my name is Joe. I'm a partner at Lenstra. Lenstra is a European IT consulting firm specialized in helping large scale enterprises build robust IT foundations. So today what we'll cover, uh, first we'll have a quick intro um, on the Caring Group. Um, we'll explain why Data Mesh was chosen for their uh, new data strategy. Then we'll speak about how data mesh and inner source can interplay together. And finally, we'll finish with you know, opening up on further perspectives of how inner source uh, can help large groups such as uh, Caring. So Caring, Caring is a global luxury group renowned for its pre prestigious brands. In the fashion sector, Caring's houses include iconic names like Gucci, Saint Laurent, Bottega Veneta, Balenciaga, Alexander McQueen, and Brioni. But beyond fashion, Kering owns non-fashion brands in the jewelry and fragrance industries, such as Boucheron, Pomelato, Dodo, Kirin, and has recently added the luxury fragrance house Crete to its portfolio. This diverse collection positions Kering as a leader in both fashion and luxury lifestyle sectors. So uh, Kering Group, established in 1963, is a global luxury leader since pivoting exclu exclusively to the highly and high-end market in 2018. So in 2023, Kering reported revenues around 19.5 billion, supported by its network of over 1,500 stores and a dedicated workforce of 48,000 employees worldwide. So we are focused on innovation, sustainability, craftsmanship. Conti Kering continues to set benchmarks in the luxury industry. Two years ago, um, Caring faced uh, somewhat of a critical challenge. Uh, the approach they had adopted previously to manage data uh, no longer met the growing demand for data across the group. And we really need to rethink about basically uh, how we manage data. Enter uh, Data Mesh, right? Um, why? Uh, because Data Mesh purpose is to make data operations uh, scalable, empowering teams to deliver uh, autonomously. So before data mesh, if you were a team at Caring and you wanted to access uh, some data, you would basically go see a, a central team uh, which managed both um, data technology and data delivery. Um, and if you wanted to have, to, to, you know, if you wanted any kind of data, you had to go speak to this team basically. The problem with this is that as demand for data increases, this central team becomes bottleneck, right? It has to process all these incoming requests for data. It has to constantly learn new business contexts because, you know, business team who ask data, they may be asking stuff on supply chain, stuff on customers. So every time it's a new business context uh, to learn, which is not easy to, to you know, uh, to do. And then also the last point why it's hard to scale and why they become a bottleneck is because the people inside the central team are often highly specialized uh, data specialists, like data engineers. The way, if we talk about data mesh, and very and this is really in a nutshell and a bit of a simplification, but basically the way data mesh answers this problem is that it separates the concern of who builds data technology with the concern of who builds data assets or what's called in the framework of data mesh data products. So if you think about the business teams uh, on the current group, this would match quite logically with the different brands, right? But the big question is who should build the self-serve uh, data platform? Should it be, should it be one, one by brand? Should it be shared across all brands? So when we're thinking about this, we sort of went back to the very traditional framework of uh, George Moore uh, about core and context. He says basically that in any enterprise, uh, you can sort of group processes and tools in two big categories. Uh, the first category is core, right? It's all the processes and tools that make you 
uh, unique that make you able to win in the competitive uh, you know market. It's where you get your competitive advantage from. So in the fashion industry, that might be like design, uh, craftsmanship, uh, your flagship stores. And then Cortex is all the rest, all the other processes and tools basically that are here to, in the end, I think, you know, support core. And these include topics like accounting and finance, maybe store maintenance, uh, office operations. So as a group, what Caring generally tries to do is to, because each brand is in the end a competitor, uh, it leaves core inside each house, inside each brand. But the context part, they try to neutralize it into shared services. Uh, obviously, why, why, why they try to do this is because this generally leads to some uh, efficiency gains. It, you know, it streamlines operations across divisions. It leads to cost reductions because you avoid having sort of redundant systems and processes across all the different houses. And in the end, it kind of enhances the focus on, on in the houses to you know, really spend their time and their effort and their money in the end and the budgets on core activities. So back to data mesh, right? When you think about data mesh, well, it really maps quite naturally to this framework of core and context. In the end, the data products, you know, some of the data products might be stuff like tools to help you design new products, right? Uh, it might be tools to help you uh, dynamically uh, price your uh, different products. Um, it might be tools that give you unique customer insights. These are really core uh, for each house. And that's something that, it seems really natural for them to keep, basically. But the self serve data platform, in the end, is fairly standard. And it's not really dependent on um, any kind of um, specific knowledge of, of each house, in, in the sense that it's today, if you want to build uh, data products in a very standard way, there's, there's tools to, uh, to do this or tools to assemble to do this. So we kind of naively decided to create um, a shared service team to build this self-serve uh, data platform. And that failed. Why? Because our houses were not at ease to depend on a shared service team to build their data products. Uh, specifically, houses feared first reduce responsiveness because depending on another team to implement a fix or a new feature could uh, slow down their uh, activities. Secondly, lack of customization, a feature might be really needed by a house but not deemed a high priority by is a shared team service. And finally, a fear of implementation of quality, not being able to see how things are, were made. So we started to really scratch our heads and on, the, on this, so to see what would be the tactic. And the logical solution came up. Let's open source the code of the platform to all teams inside the group. So let's do inner sourcing. And by this, this complete uh, flipped the perception of the houses as they started to feel empowered. Reduced responsiveness was met with the ability to do things themselves, not depending on a short service team. Lack of customization with the ability to each have their own priorities and to manage them with their own capacity. And implementation quality fear was met with full visibility of code and reasoning on feature implementation. So adopting InnoSource kind of really shifted the role of the, the shared services data platform team we had, we had created. Um, now they really became, I mean, a lot of the time actually started to become about helping other teams from the houses to contribute to this platform. More, more globally, the data platform team shifted to become uh, the InnoSource advocacy team. It spent it, today. It spends time on three topics, basically. One is on inner source advocacy. So we found that to make inner source work, it's really important to keep all the stakeholders of the company at any level, from C level all the way to developers, aligned with the concepts and principles of inner source. And today, at inside caring, you have C level executives who speak about inner source. And as long as they do that, and as long as all the other teams are aligned. Inner source, you know, continues uh, strongly and is a strong dynamic and is a strong culture. The second point that this team works on is on product vision alignment. Uh, even if you have people who contribute to this product, it's important regularly to have everybody meet together and align on where we want to take the product together. 
And finally, the role of this uh, previous Shell uh, data platform service team, which now is more like the inner source advocacy team, is to help other teams do contributions. And, and we wanted to share with you a little bit how we, how we organize the contributions from the different houses. So our contribution framework um, evolves around a concept called ADRs, um, Architecture Decision Record. This is a concept invite, um, invented, um, at least people say it's invented by Michael uh, Nigert. And it's a simple document explaining a significant architectural decision made during the development of a system. The structure of the document is first a clear title, as explanatory as possible. Then a section about context. So why do we want to make this new, you know, this new change in architecture? Why do we want to make this new uh, development? And often the context part is the one where we we lack uh, some good uh, some good content because it's one that's often quite overlooked. You know, people want to rush and and develop the the feature, but laying out the context is really key to enable other contributors to understand like why are we even why are we even talking about the, this new feature. Um, the third thing that you see in this document is decisions. So I have a section in the document um, with like a few bullet points, points sorry, which says we will uh, do this, we, we will do this, we will do that. Then in the document, you'll have a status. And finally, you will have a, a section uh, in the ADR document defining um, in laying out the consequences of the decision. So typically what we have is sort of a process for these ADRs, right? Uh, if you're a team and you want to start contributing on the data platform, what you will do is you'll start drafting uh, an ADR. What we generally do in this case is that there's somebody who will uh, accompany the contributor to write his, his or her first ADR, if, it's, if that's the case, if it's the first time they do it. And so the team will craft this ADR and then publish it. And then for the 10 next working days, any other contributor can say, I object to this ADR. I don't agree. And the, here are my reasons. This um, objection framework is something we, we use from the uh, Rust programming language when we're trying to figure out what's the best way to align and, and sort of agree on doing a specific ADR. And we found that uh, giving people the ability to object uh, gives them the generally what happens is people who have a strong opinion about the topic will speak up and those who don't really have an opinion won't say much right which in the end might be better than and, and voting when we choose about these technology uh, changes so if there is an objection the adr might go back to um you know drafting uh, but if there's no objection and the adr is approved um then the development uh, starts and the development is reviewed uh, by a trusted contributor, and once the, the, the feature is merged, it gets deployed and benefits all the all the teams working on the platform. In terms of tooling, we use uh, Jira to track all the ADR statuses. Each ADR is actually a conference page. Uh, we actually have a conference template uh, to to uh, to help teams, you know, really formalize things uh, properly. And there's um, for each ADR a dedicated uh, channel in Teams where basically all the contributors can exchange um, about it and we can keep uh, all the history. One of the things that was interesting with this ADR process is that in the beginning, we had a, an ADR meeting where all the contributors would meet and we would basically uh, go into the details of each uh, ADR and all the technical stuff. In the end, what we chose is to make this process as asynchronous as possible. Uh, whereabouts we today what we just have is like a 15 minute uh, sync meeting with all contributors just to review the status of the different uh, ADRs. But embracing inner sourcing for this project at Caring, um, it, ha it has brought a few things. First, I think it has brought a great deal of innovation. Uh, there's the Bill Joy uh, law, you know, famous that says no matter who you are, uh, most of the smartest people work for someone else. And okay. If you think about the process we went through for this platform, when we created this health service team to build a data platform, we had very smart people inside this team. But we, with the experience we had, we saw many, many contributions from people outside of this team, from the, from the different houses, which were really valuable and really brought innovation uh, to this data platform. The second thing we gained from this um, uh, inner sourcing approach to data platform is effectiveness. Um, 
in the end, we still have a service which is mutualized, uh, but the big difference is that it's built uh, by all. And the last point is on speed. What was very interesting with this uh, inner sourcing approach is that when a contributor, when a house, for example, a brand really needs a feature, they will invest in that feature and make sure the feature gets developed fast. And that's kind of an accelerator of what we would have been able to do if we just had the, the shared service team before. Globally, inner sourcing really fit well with the motto of caring, which is empowering imagination. So what was interesting during this journey is that uh, we noticed that inner source did not stop at the data platform level. So houses took the initiative to start inner sourcing certain of their data products that they considered no longer to be core. For example, one house has a basic report on how to report sales. They decided to share it to other houses. This is the second layer of inner sourcing we experienced and uh, we did not really expect. So globally, starting this inner sourcing journey at Kering with the data platform has been rewarding for the group technology, but also amazingly rewarding for all our data teams because, because inner source in the, in the end allows each team member to contribute to build collectively a great asset. And uh, early, uh, we know all that early IT practices in the 19th were often inspired by methodologies of other industries. Scrum, for example, today is used in the agile delivery in IT, but uh, was actually founded on principles by Honda and Canon manufacturing teams. And today at Kering, we often feel that other domains could be inspired by inner source. So we look forward to seeing in the next years how inner source will be more widely adopted inside the group. That's all for us. Thanks everyone. And we will open now uh, up to, to questions.